Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, my name is Rick Altman. I'm the District 31 Vice President for the United Mine Workers of America. I truly have a distinct honor today to come to you via social media. There's nothing better than be able to really look out and see, you know, the families of, of the fallen members and, and my brothers and sisters from this industry coming to unite and, and pay homage to the individuals and their families who sacrificed the most in honor of our, our coal miners. I'd like to thank my staff, Adam Fry, Tommy McGarry and Jason Todd, Gloria Sandy, Glenna Moran, and Jill Dilling. My staff hasn't missed a beat through all this. Um, they represent our membership during this pandemic when they worked from home and they're back in the office. And I want to say this, they are truly top shelf. We couldn't do what we do without them. And I, I truly appreciate the efforts that they put forward. 53 years ago, there was a tragic explosion that rocked the hills of Marion County. Not only did it rock the hills of Marion County, but also the lives of the widows, the mothers, the fathers, the children, the grandchildren, and the grandparents. Because of this explosion, the family stormed Washington, D.C. And I have two quotes that I believe have a place in the ceremony today and the tragedy that ensued. Life comes to the miners out of their death and death out of their lives. When I think about this quote from Mother Jones, I think about how many lives were saved and the indignities that future families did not have to suffer such tragedy again. I hope this quote brings some comfort to you, knowing that your loved ones did not die in vain. My second quote. I read this quote by Lois McMaster, B. Jold. I believe to be so appropriate for this and other tragedies such as the number nine. The dead cannot cry out for justice. It is the duty of the living to do that for him. And that in part is why we are here today. At this time, I would like to uh, have Sharon Clellan. Sharon was only five years old and she was one of five children when their father, David Cartwright, was so tragically died number nine explosion. Please help me welcome Sharon to the podium for the singing of the national anthem. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched where so gallantly streaming in the For the Pledge of Allegiance, I'd like to bring up Chris Nagy. Chris is a member of Local 9909, and he serves on the Veteran Committee for that local. He served in the U.S. Army from 2003 to 2015. He served stateside. He served in Afghanistan and Iraq, and, and a humanitarian in Haiti. At this time, I'd like to have Chris Nagy come up to do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. 
Brothers and sisters, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I'd like to bring up Reverend Richard Bowyer. Reverend Bowyer is a retired minister now. In November of 1968, he served eight days and nights as the chaplain coordinator at the site of the Farmington No. 9 coal mine. He was the lead pastor in consoling the families and the fallen members. Please help me welcome Reverend Bowyer to the podium, please. Thank you. I'd like to say just a few words before offering the prayer. I didn't grow up in a coal mining family. My father worked at a glass plant and was an electrician. My grandfather had worked there as well. But I was attached to the lives of union people. Having not been raised in a coal mining family, I was not that familiar with the mining industry or coal mines. But after coming to Fairmont, at some point I was elected to the board of directors of the Fairmont Clinic, which in those days was primarily a clinic serving coal miners and their families. When this disaster occurred, both because of my being a minister and on that board, I was invited to come out and to assist the staff of the clinic and others who were responding <clears throat> to the suffering and agony and grief of the families and loved ones of those who were trapped below. About three months before this explosion, some of us board members and staff of Fairmont Clinic were invited and spent about two hours in a complete tour of Farmington Number no. 9. It's the only coal mine I was ever in and I've not been inside a mine since that time. But because I had that experience, I think in many ways, I was better equipped to respond and to understand the dynamics of the search efforts that were going on. This gathering has been extremely meaningful to me in my life, and that total experience has been profound in the shaping of my ministry in subsequent years. May we pray. Gracious and eternal God, we gather again to reflect upon and to honor and respect the lives of these 78 men who died in the Farmington No. 9 mine. We pray your blessings and your comfort upon their families and other descendants and those who were close to them as friends and loved ones. We give you thanks that in the intervening years, Family members, United Mine Workers, and other advocates were able to press the Congress of the United States to pass laws and to implement regulations and rules that have provided a much more safe environment for those working beneath the ground. We ask for your guidance and your direction that we would continue to be faithful, to continue to hold up the efforts to maintain and to expand the safety of those who do so much to give us the lives that we live today. Again, we're grateful for these men whose lives were lost tragically, but who subsequently have contributed to the transformation of mind safety that has saved countless other lives that might otherwise have been lost. Bless these who are gathered the families and loved ones, wherever they may be, and continue us in faithful service to protect the lives of all those who work in our behalf. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. I get the honor today also to introduce uh, the Secretary Treasurer Brian Sanson. Brian has, uh, for the people that really don't know Brian that well, he began his career in local 1582 
um, that surface. Uh, Brian's been really working for this union on around year 2000 with the United Mine Workers at the Career Center, where he counseled laid off members and and uh, in in trying to place them in jobs. I'm going to tell you, Brian is one of the hardest workers I've ever met. He's probably one of the straightest shooters I've ever met. Um, he's honest. He's intelligent. His heart and soul belongs to this United Mine Workers from President Roberts all the way down to the membership of every rank and file number. And at this time, it, it truly gives me one of the proudest moments in my, in my career is to introduce our International Secretary Treasurer, Brian Sanson. Thank you so much, Rick, for that introduction. This is a tragedy that a coal company blatantly disregarded the safety of miners, and as a result, there was a huge loss of life affecting generations of families, wives, sons, grandsons. The importance of this event is to continue to honor these miners and the sacrifices that they made, which have ensured strong health and safety laws for coal miners across this country. Your sacrifice has not been in vain. The work that you have done over the decades to ensure that coal miners can go to work and come home safely cannot be measured. The sacrifices that you all have laid at the altar of workers' rights is unmeasured. I want to thank you, Brian, for taking the time to, uh, to be with us and our membership at, at this time. I really get the greatest pleasure of any one person can truly ask, and, uh, and I get to introduce the keynote speaker, and that would be our president, Cecil Roberts. President Roberts has, with all of us, but his leadership, we have health care for our retirees. We have a pension that is guaranteed. He's never wavered in a fight to protect not only the active miners, the retiree miners, the widows. He truly is the epitome of a caring and thoughtful man when it comes to this membership in this nation. He's also known as the most militant and dynamic leader that probably the world has ever seen. And, and, and I think that's what makes him so well. He has compassion and he's not afraid of a fight. Uh, he spends every waking moment working for this union and every person that's affiliated with it. I've never known him to ever take no for an answer. And, uh, and with his leadership, we will always, always survive and be fruitful. So, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of the United Mine Workers of America, Cecil E. Roberts. Thank you, Vice President Altman, for that wonderful introduction. You're so kind, and we appreciate all the hard work that you do in order to make District 31 one of the best districts around. And we want to thank the staff of District 31 here for a moment. I know how much work goes into this uh, event when we seek to honor those who died in 1968 and the explosion at number nine. I also want to recognize my good friend, uh, Vice President Emeritus Mike Caputo for his involvement. And he's been here every single year. But I also think this is all about remembering those miners who passed, but you can't do that without recognizing the families that are always at this event. And just like you, I am ready to do this uh, next year in person so I can see my friends, the families. These families uh, were large families for the most part. I've talked to family members and well, there was eight of us, there's nine of us, there's 10 of us. I'm talking about the kids. So almost immediately, uh, without any uh, ability to plan for this. A woman who was a wonderful wife, a wonderful mother, kept the household going, was told, your husband's gone. 
Well, that's tragic. But then she has to go to the children in the house and say, Stem, Dad's not coming home. Now she has to deal with grieving children. She has to deal with the fact that the person she loved the most in the world is gone, the person she depended on the most is gone. But then she comes to the realization the person who made the money that keep this house so going is no longer with us. How are we going to do this? And I've heard so many stories about how this worked. The kids went out and did the best they could if they were old enough to do it. The wife, the widow, ended up with a job uh, part-time sometimes, full-time sometimes. And so the entire uh, environment around each of these households was just turned upside down. But having met uh, many of the widows, many of the children, then the grandchildren, and now some of the great-grandchildren from the Farmington disaster, what wonderful people. Uh, the mothers, the wives, the widows should be given the most praise here of those who are still surviving for what they were able to do to keep those families moving. They raised wonderful citizens of the state of West Virginia and of our country. Uh, they went on to be uh, people who were very productive in whatever they did. Now let's talk about the coal miners. They were young, old, some have been in the mines for a little while, some have been in the mines for a long period of time. No one knew uh, that they weren't coming back home when they left home and kissed their wives goodbye, their kids goodbye. But what we did have is some really hard working, truly wonderful Americans working that shift. And then an explosion occurred and unfortunately, in most instances, when an explosion of this magnitude takes place, lives end almost immediately. There were some miners that were able to get out of the mine, but only a handful. So today we think about those 78 miners that perished. And you have 78 different stories here. And you have 78 families that could tell you how much they love these people. There wasn't a single law on the books that protect these miners on the federal level. There was no orders out there that says, you have to do things this way, company. There was a conversation that was started by the widows, by the family members, locally, that this should never happen to another family in America. You can't bring back our family members. You can't bring back my husband. But no other woman in this country should experience this. We're going to Congress. We're going to demand that the federal government pass health and safety laws to protect all coal miners in this nation. The Congress of the United States in 1969, about a year after this explosion, acted and said coal miners deserve to be protected and they passed the first federal legislation that protected coal miners. It gave you a right to a safe working place if you were a coal miner. It put fines on coal companies if they did the wrong thing. The coal industry said, oh, this will put us out of business. And we've heard that a million times, no matter what we're talking about, whether it's workers' compensation, black lung benefits, making the mines safer. It never happened. The mines became safer. The mines remained productive. And we would not have had those laws had this terrible event not happened. And I've for many years said that these miners who perished on this day are heroes. So as we gather virtually next year in person, once again, may God bless the family members. May God bless those that perished. May God bless the UMWA and all of those who have benefited from the actions of these activists and the fact that these miners gave their lives for all of us. Thank you, President Roberts, for taking the time to uh, be with us today. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, at this time we will place the reefs in front of the memorial. On behalf of the unrecovered miners, Judge Jim Matish, he is the son of Frank Matish.
On behalf of the United Mine Workers of America, District 31, Adam Fry and Jason Todd, On behalf of District 31 local unions, Mike Knight, President of Local Union 1473, and Mike Singleton, President of Local Union 9909. On behalf of the United Mine Workers of America International Union, Rick Altman, International District 31 Vice President, Mike Caputo, International District 31 Vice President Emeritus, and Terry Osborne, International VP at Large. On behalf of the victims' families, Tom Anderson, John Toothman, Robert Kearns. At this time, I would like to call up Mike Caputo to read off uh, the list of the fallen members from the number nine on November 20th, 1968. Please welcome Mike Caputo. Thank you, Rick. I'd like to thank Vice President Altman for allowing me the honor and the privilege to do the roll call once again at the number nine memorial. And I would like those listening to please reflect reflect on the sacrifices that they made so those of us that worked in the industry after them had a safer place to work. Following is a list of 78 men that lost their lives in the number nine explosion on November 20th, 1968. Arthur A. Anderson Jr. Jack O. Armstrong Thomas D. Ashcraft Jimmy Barr, Orville D. Beam, John Joseph Bingaman, Thomas Bogus, Lou S. Boros, Harold W. Butt, Lee E. Carpenter, David Cartwright, William E. Currents, Dale E. Davis, Albert R. DeBerry, Howard A. Deal, George O. Decker, James E. Efall, Joe Ferris, Virgil A. Pete Forte, Hillary Wade Foster. Alda G. Freeman, Jr., Robert 
L. Glover, Forrest B. Golf, John F. Guz, Charles F. Hardman, Ebert E. Hartzell, Simon P. Hayes, Paul F. Henderson, Roy F. Henderson, Sr., Steve Horvat, Junior M. Jenkins, James Jones, Pete J. Kaznowski, Sr., Robert D. Kearns, Charles E. King, James Ray Nicely, George R. Kovar, David Manella Sr., Walter R. Martin, Frank Matish, Hartzell L. Maley, Dennis N. McDonald, Emilio D. Magna, Jack D. Michael, Wayne R. Minor, Charles E. Moody, Paul O. Moran, Ardren W. Morris, Joseph Muto, Randall R. Parsons, Raymond R. Parsons, Nicholas Petro, Fred Burt Rogers, William D. Sheen, Robert J. Sigley, Henry J. Skorzynski, Russell D. Snyder, John Soputch, Jerry L. Stone King, Harry L. Strait, Albert Takis, William L. Takis, Dewey Tarley, Frank Tate Jr., Goy A. Taylor, Hoy B. Taylor, Edwin A. Tennant, Homer E. Titchener, Dennis L. Toller, John W. Toothman, Gordon H. Tremble, Roscoe M. Triplett, William T. Walker, James H. Walters, Lester B. Willard, Edward A. Williams, Lloyd William Wilson, Jerry R. Inero. Please join me in a moment of silence for these fallen miners. For the benediction, I'd like to bring up my good friend, Jack Reinhardt from Local 1702. <clears throat> Today, we share, I can understand how the families felt this day. I lost my father in October of 1984 to a terrible mining accident. So I'm going to ask that we have a moment of silence before I pray for those who were killed in mining accidents and that terrible disease, black lung. So let's go to the Lord in a moment of silence. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that we come to this place, this holy place where these men are heroes in our lives today. Each and every day, Lord, I thank you for them because what came out of this has thousands and thousands of miners that have been protected by that situation. Lord, I know where they are today. And Lord, I ask you now to put the blessings upon the family, Lord, each and every day, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren are coming to this place now and learning about their father and their grandfathers, Lord. 
But Lord, you have been good to us. You sent us our Redeemer, Lord. This morning I ask this all in the name of the risen Savior, Jesus, and in his most precious name we pray. God bless us. Bless the families today. And God bless the United Mine Workers of America. Amen. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, um, that concludes the program. And I thank everybody for attending and uh, see you hopefully next year live at this site.